We are currently live on the Council's YouTube site where the meeting will be webcast at live or subsequent broadcast. And members of the press and public may take photos and recordings, etc., where there are potential exempt items, as always. Uh, but apologies today, I'm not Councillor Ian Ward, I'm Richard Jones. Um, Ian uh, has had some apologies, this is elsewhere. I've got apologies from John Hunt, a um, Liberal Democrat group, uh, Dr. Palmer is substituting. Um, Councillor Sharon Hussein sadly has had to send last minute apologies as she's unwell, and Councillor Sharon Thompson uh, will be with us shortly. She is running late. On the officer side, I've got apologies from Greg Betts, uh, but Louise Collett is substituting, and Andy Coldrick and uh, Dr. Justin Varney as well. Any other apologies to note? No. Okay, a uh, declaration of interests. Never the reminder they must declare all the relevant pecuniary and non pecuniary interests uh, in the business to be discussed today. Seeing any hands for anything that hasn't already been declared. And there is exempt information uh, on a number of reports today. Uh, can I ask whether there are any um, exempt items where matters would like to raise issues that may affect the decision to be made or ask clarification on any of the exempt items? Okay. Uh, any particular ones we should watch out for, just in terms of ordering the agenda? And Oh, that's that's nice and easy. That's fine. I don't have to rearrange that. Stop. I think it's a spot of choice. Okay. Lovely. Uh, right, that takes into the main business then. So, kick off in item five, which is medium term financial plan update, which is Councillor Tristan Chatfield. Good morning, thank you, um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so members will be familiar by now with the format um, of this report. Um, it is the update to the medium term financial plan, which we're attempting to now build on a quarterly um, basis. It also summarises the actions being taken to close the gap, the financial gap we have in future years, through progressing transformative opportunities covering three, uh, three themes. Uh, delivering new ways of working, fit for the purpose council, and shifting our focus on crisis and prevention, along with the PACE agenda of increasing the pace and scale of growth. Um, this report is an update to the July 2021 uh, update, which all will remember, and forms part of a wide initiative to improve financial processes, where potential issues are identified at an early stage that allow for strategic actions to be taken. The last update on the MCFP provided on 27th of July identified that due to a combination of expenditure pressures and changes in resourcing assumptions, the financial gap was around 116 million for the period 25 and 26. The latest projections indicate that this position has unfortunately deteriorated since reported in July, with the gap now estimated to be in the region of 126 million by 25 26, an increase of 10 million. So I won't go into um, further detail, of course, and we'll have to take any questions. Thank you, Are there any questions? Councillor Matthew. Uh, thanks very much, Bridget. Um, it's just really around item uh, 3.16 uh, on travel assist. I uh, see there's a further 6.8 million uh, being put in there as a short term measure. And, and that, as you referred to, that comes on top of the July 2021 report, where there's an extra £3 million uh, was put into the service there. And, and of course, as corporate parents, we, we welcome any money being spent uh, to sort of keep the travel of our children uh, safe. But, you know, you just wonder um, how much value for money uh, is being sort of being gained from the previous money that's been spent on the contract. Uh, Councillor Booth took over as cabinet member and she carried out a reorganisation. There was money spent there and told that this was the reorganisation that was going to solve it. Then uh, Ian Ward, the leader, took personal responsibility. He called in Ernest and Young. We had money spent there, and now we've got Councillor Thompson who took over with a new start, and we had those two together. We're looking at 9.8 million. And, you know, I can't help but feel that we had a very late cancellation at the end of the contract last time uh, due to DBS measures. I'm just wondering how much of this money is being spent for people who get a new supplier in when it's a new supplier at the last minute. Is there good value being caused from disruption there? And, so I welcome the money being spent, but just hope we get a good value for money. But the um, the residents obviously welcome anything to keep children safe. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'll take all the questions and then bring people back. Uh, that's all done. Thank you. A um, couple more questions. I, I think just picking up on, on that point, um, is there some assurance that we can get the good 
some or majority of this extra money isn't just going to be spent on yet more consultants to come in and do a review of the department and not actually fix what's wrong in the department. Um, also, is there going to be some ownership of this spend by the cabinet members? So that actually needs cabinet members sign up of extra spend rather than it just being delegated away to officers to spend um, as they see fit. And then page 10 touches on it and highlights that it's a one-off injection of 6.83 million euro. And um, how confident is the cabinet that 6.8 million actually is a one-off and won't be required in future years of the MTF? Uh, turning to 3.15, there's table one, and it talks about an extra 4.5 million being uh, needed in the waste service in years three and four. I wonder if the cabinet perhaps expand on that. And then 3.16, uh, further down to what Councillor McAway it highlights the HR new operating model. Um, and it says there's been some slippage in the hiring of staff. So of the extra 3.5 million, 1 million of it won't be required um, for the year 22-23. That seems like an awful lot of slippage, an awful long way out from that deadline. Um, so how late is the recruitment process actually expected to be? If, what are we, 18 months before that time, we're already expecting not to spend a million of that money that was claimed previously, was definitely new. And then the final comment is on the risk register, um, they're all, or the, the budget register, um, they're all listed as green. Um, and I just wondered if, is that we're saying they're actually we're confident they're all green, or is it actually just a mistake and something we should be able to cut? Okay, I'll bring Councillor Harmer next. Okay, a couple of um, areas. First of all, in terms of the budget consultation process, which obviously is particularly important, um, and we just be assured that um, people will be given um, basically meaningful choices about what the alternatives are and how spending will be prioritised. Um, and secondly, on energy inflation, um, the line says in table two, additional energy inflation due to market restructure. Um, I mean, presumably that is uh, referring to the global situation at the moment in terms of energy prices. Um, but it, it sort of indicates that there's an extra 8.354 million in energy costs in next financial year. Um, but then after that, very modest extra costs. So 23, 24, it's about 0.331. That seems optimistic. Um, I mean, when we talk about market restructure, they tend to be permanent. Um, you know, obviously, everyone will hope that we don't see the peaks that we see at the moment in the system, but there's a reasonable risk that there will be some increase compared with what we've always given before, passing into the long term. So just we like a bit more information about the assumptions behind that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, there's a number of things there. Um, I'm conscious lots of the questions are about travel assistance and the cabinet members um, running late at the moment, and we do have a substantial agenda item on that topic later. Uh, that said, I'll turn to uh, the DCS and see if want to come in with lending on the mail now. So you've had a question coming So on, on this, yes. Yeah, so um, allowance has to be made in the budget uh, for memory, uh, I think it's about 4.1 million against the new contract for hats. But that does not necessarily mean that would be spent. But that has to be allowed because we can know that before the intent. I mean, that whole transfer from having to cease the contract, which I believe is the right decision, because as you mentioned, because of their failure to apply by our safety plan regulations. Did create a situation where we've had to make allowances. So some of about three million is around that. As the hands contracts have to stand, we'll have more accurate figures. And um, with, with the fair length that might reduce, but I don't want to say yes or no at this stage. So that's that's one area. The in in basically the implied problems in the RTU allowances has, has to be made, but the current establishment we've got is 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 more than the base budget. Uh, it could be about twice the yeah. There is an ongoing project being led by uh, Rob James, which is looking at the prospects of an integrated transport unit. And that is looking at the spectrum for transport costs as well as across the zoning part and across the community. 
and the other bits of that project will be able to like, invert into that capacity to make sure A, we store all the service, but we can actually reduce that, that amount. On the area I'm, I'm uh, most concerned with in terms of detail is the projections around the travel costs themselves, which are travel costs plus the cost of flights. Um, and um, we need to work on more robust information. And where we are on that is we need to see the actual spend of September and October to see if projection will be revised, either up or down, and then do a thorough analysis of how that spend is, is being taken forward. Um, I think there is better governance now on that area. The task of finishing it will take a few on having to take the in terms of officer, that was better governance than I understand the year before. The project on the ITU as well, the one by my office is reporting in to members, so that's better. Uh, on consultants, there is sometimes a genuine need for short term additional advice and capacity. And this is an area where sometimes you need additional expertise. So I, I think that is, is more than control, uh, but uh, I, I do I hand it up to Sue and we will be handing up the idea we need to do a much more thorough review and analysis of where that spend is. Looking at supply chains, for example, have we got too many contractors? Could we do more? Um, and longer term, could we, could we actually encourage more children who can send to follow independent travel routes with the right support and guidance? So, this is this sort of big amount of work to continue to get a and switch out to where this council is advised. And you've referenced Sue, so, so uh, as I introduced you at the beginning, but the, uh, the, the TA item, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll just introduce you now. So, so Sue Harrison is joining us uh, as the new DCS uh, Director of Children's Services from, I think, mid November? First of November. First of November. Fantastic. Uh, so just welcome to, to Cabinet today and uh, good to have you three with us. Thank you. Can I just make one contribution? I mean, there's, there's an overall principle, but I think it's really important that, that Cabinet and members of the opposition are aware of, and that is, um, where possible, we will be recruiting permanently into posts rather than the reliance of interims and consultants. I, I need to stabilise the top team first, um, which which we are doing, and uh, I'm really pleased to um, to be able to report that we're accelerating the recruitment of, of the top team permanently which I think will give real stability to the organisation. And then we need to assess the capability in the next year's term. Um, but, but until I can do that, there are really urgent things that this council needs to deliver for residents of this city. So, but we are absolutely mindful that where we can recruit permanently, we will absolutely do so. Yeah, right, a number of other questions there, so I'll move us on. Um, Tristan, do you want to come up on the HR? Yeah, I will pick up the HR yeah. if I can. Just in terms of that, of that slippage, it purely reflects the ability to recruit um, actually the recruitment market. Um, you know, you can't ever guarantee you can bring everyone in on day one. It's just, you know, um, have to wait and see what happens. But I would say that the consultation on the new HR structure has now gone live. Um, that's being done with trade unions and, and staff, and then that should be fully implemented by April 2022. So as we move into the next financial year, we should have that um, properly set up and operating and send it over to consultation. Thank you. That's HR. Um, can I just make a quick point on the, um, if I can, make a slightly political point around the pressures around home school transport. I think um, it's not just Birmingham, there is a national pressure around children's social care. And I think um, government is recognised to an extent but I would say that if there's one message I'll send to government and the fund, general financial position of local councils, uh, two things. One of them is reflecting the loss of income that we're still suffering as a result of COVID. Um, and the other one relates to children's social services, uh, children's social care, and the desperate need. I think it's not just Birmingham, but it's across the country. The desperate need to reflect the top and the increasing the demand pressures on those services. And quite frankly, we're, at some point, government is going to have to act. It's just a question of whether acts in advance or it waits until we reach a point of crisis in local government as a whole. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, right, other points. Uh, Shay, do you want to come in on the, the waste? Uh... Uh, yes, uh, as you know, these, these costs are back within or better than 24 on the new contract. Um, part of that will be related to uh, the investment we have to make as part of that contract, including improvements to the middle lane side uh, and uh, some other changes that we expect in terms of. Uh, long term uh, cost on electricity and 
um, increase the costs of exposing and drying with recycling. So it's really the most costs. Okay. And I don't really have to check the other just on the last few points as well. Yeah, there's a couple of questions in terms of harm as well. Um, the, the, budget, the question around the budget consultation actually quite neatly hits on what we're actually trying to achieve, which is to give residents a, 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 an ability or um, the capacity to take an interest in where the priorities sit for the organisation. So we are developing um, a new model of consultation, which hopefully we'll be able to um, show members um, in very short term, well, obviously, that's really short term, you need to move into the consultation fairly quickly. Um, using an app system that I think other local authorities have used successfully, and I think that would be an interesting um, opportunity. If somebody wants to do last year, but obviously there's just so much going on, we, we can do it. But hopefully this year we're, we're well into the process of doing that. So it's something that um, I'll, we'll bring forward to some members can have a look at before we go out to, to the public. And then in terms of energy inflation, um, obviously we try as best we can to hedge our uh, energy positions, take a long term view on energy price increases. Um, we generally pay quite a low uh, price for that because of the hedging. Um, but obviously, um, it's market uncertainty. I or no one else in this room knows what the market is going to do in a year, two years, let alone in five years' time. So I'm afraid we just have to use our best judgment on that. Prices may go up, they may go down. There are different views about that. And obviously, there is always pressure in terms of the regulation environment we're in. Um, there may be further things to come out of the COP summit at the moment that may have an impact on future energy prices. But say that's largely speculative. All we can try and do is to get ourselves into the best fixed price position we possibly can in terms of protecting the council's position as for as long term as we can. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's everything covered. Councillor Mackie, do you want to cover? Uh, it's yeah. just the last question the council on there was asking about um, the risk register was showing everything green. And just to put some flesh on the bones of what I think he was asking there was that on one of the items, there's a 50% likelihood of a highways contract. They're having a potential impact of 50 million pounds with a probable weighted impact of 25 million has, has a green rag which is the same rag as the as another item that has a likelihood of a two percent chance with an impact of one million now there seems to be two different things going on there the mitigation of one of them is listed as re-procuring re again with extra funding now i don't think that's a mitigation that's just consequence of what happens if the whole thing falls over um, and there was another one, the Commonwealth Games has got a 40 percent risk of an overspend uh, with no residual risks listed against it. The mitigations listed against that are just talking to government or to partners. There's no sort of mitigation of what we will do to try and stop that. Um, and, and I think that's what we're getting as things that green, so it looks very rosy. But if you dig into the detail on that, I, I would feel comfortable about some of those. Can I bring um, Becky Hallard in on this point, I think? Um, I, I think I can help with the overall um, structure of this. So those aren't green as in rag ratings. That's just highlighting where we've got to the quantification of each risk. OK, so that's why they all look green. So um, hopefully that helps. In terms of the um, highways PFI and, and Rob may want to come in on this one too, as we work through and get closer to the longer term procurement, we get more certainty. Okay. Now we are doing sub-market testing, so we're talking to suppliers before we put any spec out because that, that's what you expect us to do. Until we get the prices back in, we cannot shift that that risk and the weight of it accordingly. So the, the main part point of, of, of sharing this overall risk register is. We, we, we do it in a lot of depth, a lot more depth than most authorities do, as in we put numbers against it, we times it by a probability factor, and the overall sum of it at the bottom, we then equate to what we've got in terms of our finance resilience reserve. So we're saying we're still fully covered as we go now. If at any point we get out of culture on that, then we will formally rectify that through cabinet. We won't work wait until the next budget round. Most authorities only do this once a year. You know, last year we introduced a six month and now we're bringing it quarterly. You know, so so we're well on the front foot on this. But if we ever come out of quarter on it, then we'll be straight back into the cabinet and say we think we need to increase the finance resilience reserve. Does that does that help? Yeah. A bit of at the table as well on the yeah, just to echo those those comments, and as we uh, work through with the Department of Transport and Birmingham Highways Limited, we've submitted a uh, strategic outline business case to the Department of Transport that has been approved 
uh, by the investment committee. Uh, we're now in the process of uh, drawing up the outline business case, which we need to submit by the 6th of December, uh, and then we'll go through the procurement phases. But as Becky says, we're currently going through uh, soft market testing to see uh, the interest in the contract, and we'll take that forward, always remembering, of course, that the contract is with Birmingham Highways Limited, and they take all of that process. But we're working together with them, uh, with Birmingham Highways Limited, and with the Department of Transport to see these contracts. Uh, we will swim. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move us on. If that's okay, I've got my packed agenda. Um, not seeing any other hands either. So, is uh, we've got recommendations. Um, just going to find recommendations in front of me. I've got recommendations. Uh, just 2.1 on this one in front of us. Uh, are those agreed? Agreed. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, right, item six, back to Councillor Chatfield, Social Family Policy and Birmingham Business Charter for Social Responsibility Update. Thank you, Bridget. Um, yeah, so this is a, a good news item. I think hopefully we've warmly welcomed um, by Cabinet and, and colleagues. Um, so this is an update onto our uh, social value policy and obviously the work we've been doing around Birmingham Business Charter for Social Responsibility, both of which were launched um, September, in two, September 2013. They have been updated since, but this is the latest update. I was keen to bring this forward for a number, there's been a number of significant changes and I wanted to have an opportunity to bring this to Cabinet to endorse um, those changes. So um, the report lists them, but I will quickly go through them if I can, um, Deputy Leader. Firstly is the incorporation of a new measure to commit uh, to procurement's contribution to the net zero carbon agenda by 2030, I hope it will be uh, welcomed. The declaration of the council's support for the UK Steel Charter, which I think is particularly timely given the pressures that sector is under. Um, I'm really pleased to work with both business and trade union colleagues on our commitment around UK Steel. The adoption of the Fair Tax Foundation's Council Mark for Fair Tax de Council Declaration uh, for Fair Tax, uh, which again, I think is a politically important message that we send that we expect organisations we do business with um, to pay their fair share of tax and we'll be encouraging them and others to do that. Uh, the incorporation of social value consideration into the planning process as a fairly early stage is something that other local authorities are exploring, a limited number of other local authorities, and is something that we are keen here in Birmingham to explore as well. And there's a working group already being set up on that. So hopefully I'll be able to report back more detail on how that's progressing in the future um, cabinet. Um, raising the default minimum social value rating to 20%, again, I think it's significant. Uh, not that this doesn't indicate that every single contract with 20%, but it absolutely will be the threshold. We've, unless there are very compelling reasons why it will be below 20%, that will now be our absolute standard approach. Should be noted that many, there's already, we often operate at 20% as it is, but this is really just um, putting that in concrete so that that becomes the absolute standard for us as an organisation. The introduction of the very exciting Match My Project Portal. This is an opportunity for um, businesses to directly link in with local community groups and projects to fund them. Um, and that can either be um, directly off the back of procurement with Birmingham City Council, or it can be uh, through their own CSR agenda and their own CSR approach. And that website is up and live. And again, we're doing a session for members so they can find out more about that. That's a really exciting project and one that gives companies, I think, that it's, um, especially our larger companies that may not have direct links into communities, an opportunity to understand what needs and what demands there are, and then link those two um, directly together. Uh, the revision of financial thresholds, which the um, charter becomes a requirement, I think that detailed out in the report. Um, and then a couple of other minor technical um, things, but then also an outline of our social value achievements, where we are to date, and I think, and that's included in the report. Um, I could just pull out a couple of really exciting um, of those measures. So uh, local employment, we delivered 68,148 weeks of local employment, 4,607 weeks of local apprenticeships, 10,825 hours of local voluntary time, um, and then a, a total to local spend, which I do think genuinely incredible, reflects on the scale of ambition of this organisation. That local spend is over 194 million which I think gives you a sense of the sort of um, scale and importance of us as an organisation within the local economy and how vital um, those big projects and big programmes all the way through from uh, regeneration into social care, all of the big, big spends we do, they do have a vital part to play in supporting the local economy. Um, and with that, we'll hand over to the Chair for any questions. 
Okay. There's a huge amount that's been achieved there uh, as a result of the charter. Uh, and it's been a massive leader for us as a council in terms of their uh, delivery and huge amount with the city. Uh, so it's really exciting to have that summarised and see where it's going next. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give credit to Council Morgan, who was quick on the calculator, who, and we appreciate the level of spend, but I think that's less than 6% of our spend goes locally, so we welcome that, but obviously we encourage more, as much local spend as possible. We have a huge budget and as much as money we can spend, it would be wonderful. Um, yeah, we welcome the report. I, when I read it, I was quite, I tried to think, think about how this would put in, how we would do this in practice. If you notice me, if you read the report, and you'll say implementation delivery, I think, is quite what we all want to see at the end of the day. And, I was very aware that having sat through quite a number of these cabinets now, very lucky to do so, that um, we come across quite a lot of single contract negotiations where we're told that there's only one contract to do the spend, or we come across contracts that there wasn't enough time for procurement to do something, so it ends in the single contract negotiation, or we run sort of out of contract. And, and as you say, I was then noted that point 3.1 says that the council has a statutory duty in accordance with Public Services Act 2012 in regard to the economic, social, and environmental well-being in connection with public service contracts. So, you know, with the example of hacks, this is we mentioned that earlier on today, but there's others, one coming up later on on the agenda. Um, how do we do apply uh, all these social charters, etc., to these to these uh, PPE we have to buy? Uh, other things that we had to buy during the pandemic that we've had to buy in the very last minute and we've run out of time. How, how do we apply these social charters to all these purchase contracts and how does it implement them? Thank you. Any other questions? No. Oh, sorry. That's my question. Yeah. Can I ask if I may? There's a number of lots of people in the industry for in the industry. Um, particularly to make it in my portfolio into my initial apprenticeships. I'm volunteering, which means it's huge, a huge important so volunteering opportunities. It's not that we make really two permanent jobs, but I'm still going to thank you so much for the work that they Thank you. Right, I'm not seeing the man. Uh, so, Kevin yeah. Chatfield, back to you. Yes. Now, we'll make the point, obviously, um, that uh, none of this would happen without the engagement of the whole organisation. So, social value only comes about as a result of all the hard work that, that the, um, the executive and um, senior directors do in terms of driving forward that, that positive agenda. Um, in terms of the, the, the percentage figure, I think it's slightly misleading in the sense that that figure, the figure you're taking for our overall spend, obviously includes a significant amount of staff salaries. Um, vast, you know, vast majority of what we spend ultimately spend on people. Um, and at something well over 80%, I mean about 88% over so the top of my head, um, of our staff live within the city and obviously spend money uh, locally, and that's, that's what we all do. So um, if you take that away in terms of the pure cash spend into the economy, it is very significant. I think at the last the last figures I saw that, that that 194 million is something around 70% of our, of our free capital, you know, free uh, revenue capital spend in the city. So significant amounts of money if you take out the staffing. But I can get details on that. In terms of the implementation, it all obviously it depends on the delegation. The charter sets up the thresholds. It all depends on the volume of spend. And then obviously, uh, once we get into the, the commitments are made during the procurement process, successful tender or make commitments, um, those commitments are then monitored with the, with the normal contractual management um, process. Um, and I'm pleased to say that on my, um, I've done things, I have conversations with some of my big contractors and suppliers. And actually, some of some of our, um, without, I don't want to name check certain companies, <laughs> not others, um, but I would say that some of the things they do locally are, you know, are, are fantastic. I'm sure we've all got examples in our ward where, off the back of council procurement, we deliver um, substantial social value in every corner of the city. But obviously, it's something we're always pressing to drive up. And I think um, part of the My Project scheme, I think, is an opportunity to really see um, the bones of how that operates. So, company A links with with project, um, company A supplies hours or, or, or money or time, resource, whatever it might be, um, and that then delivers um, substantial benefit to local residents. So um, appreciate as members of, of Cabinet and Council don't often see the mechanics of implementation, but hopefully that my project will too give us an opportunity. And um, that's a hugely exciting uh, new thing that we've got there. Right, I'm not seeing any other hands. Uh, so we've got recommendation of 2.1 to 2.5 in front of us. Are those agreed? Lovely, really? thank you. Right, item seven is up next. Birmingham Transport Plan over to Councillor Burke. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, the Birmingham Transport Plan sets up a vision and principles for transport investment in the period to 2031. As colleagues will be aware, in early 2020, the uh, consultation started on the draft Birmingham Transport Plan. And this document summarised the feedback received. Uh, this feedback has informed the final version of the plan, which seeks uh, approval to their cabinet. The vision uh, remains the same. However, the principles have been updated to reflect new development developments in the city, particularly the change in traffic patterns as a result of the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, just to summarise the four key principles, uh, principle one, road space will be reallocated to support the delivery of a fully integrated, high quality public transport system. Number two, the city centre will be transformed uh, to create safe and healthy environments for walking and cycling, as well as priority routes for public transport. Number three, active travel will be prioritising all centres and neighbourhoods. Uh, 20 mile per hour limits will be rolled out further on all residential roads. Uh, and uh, the fourth one is parking will be used as a means to manage demand for the travel by car and land conduct by, by car parking will be put to more productive use. As colleagues will be aware, Birmingham is delighted by poor air quality and significant health inequalities. Investment in our transport system and implementation of schemes that prioritise people over cars will help develop a cleaner, greener, healthier and more sustainable environment. And finally, the measures outlined in this plan aim to uh, serve a future Birmingham that is home to more people, and that is a better environment in which to live and work for everybody, irrespective of age, disability, or income. It's, it's in the fact creating a better Birmingham for everyone. Um, I ask Cabinet to approve the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or queries? <laughs> right, I'll go Councillor Alden, Councillor Harmer, Councillor Matthew. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's some positive things when you look at the comments that Councillor said around supporting the reopening of railway lines, and that's really important. It's pretty clear that that's going to be one of the most significant ways we can improve public transport uses from the city is by getting, um, well, so the Camp Hill line is in the process and the station. Planning, etc. Um, you've got the Tamworth line going to the north of the city, it's a certain part line as well. Um, and frankly, there needs to be a, a, a bit of work done about looking where else actually could new rail spurs be also put in. Um, because I think pretty much all the, all the satisfaction that there is when you look at it, rail is the public transport of choice, really, where, where people have that choice. Um, and so that is definitely something that we should be promoting more. I think it's also welcome some of the comments in here around obviously pedestrian safety, um, safety in the city centre, but also in, in suburbs and particularly around uh, vulnerable locations like schools where there's um, obviously we're trying to encourage people to walk to school and make, need to make sure those journeys are safe as well. Um, but then uh, sadly there is also some, some negatives in there. I think. Um, and the cabinet member may have already seen some of the, the feedback from um, Birmingham Mails articles around this, um, particularly when you look at the, the option to close the tunnels. Um, and the cabinet member was very clear there in, in his introduction to the report, he said that he's asking cabinet to adopt the final plan. Um, so it's in a draft plan, it's the final plan. And the plan is very clear that private vehicles will not be going through the tunnel anymore. This administration remains in control for the length of time of this plan, um, because it says so in here, that the tunnels will be repurposed. And it's clear that that would be disastrous for the city. When you already look at the displaced traffic onto the ring road that's happened, the ring road is chock a block. When you look at um, so what's happened actually only this morning from some of the, uh, effectively a trial and a, a, a lane closure, because actually a lane was being used for um, by some builders. So it was closed off one of the lanes at Lancaster the Circus. That blocked up back almost to the motorway junction along the Aston Expressway. Um, if those tunnels are closed for three platforms, what that means is tens of thousands of journeys a day will be going above the ground into congestion, worsening the air quality, worsening the congestion on the ring road. Um, so I think that's a serious thing and clearly needs to be stopped. It's, it's frankly clear that those journeys are happening quicker over shorter distance and less congestion. And the tunnel system, which is underground, and could easily have a filtration system to run to clean the air would actually be far better for everyone in the city than putting those people into traffic jams above ground. Um, there's also lots of comments in here around reducing car park spaces. 
putting the prices up. And obviously, we've already heard previously about the cabinet plans to prevent car park spaces at new developments in the city centre. And of course, the impact of that is actually that's going to prevent an electrical link rollouts in the city. Because if there's no car park spaces, there's no car charging spaces. Because you need a car park space to be able to have a charging space. Um, so actually, what in effect this plan is saying to the city is don't buy an electric car because you ain't going to have anywhere to park it to charge it. Because there is no provision being made in here for new developments to actually have mandated within it electric car parking spaces. Um, and that is a massively short-sighted thing, though it perhaps ties in with the impression this council gives that the issue is they just simply don't want people to drive any kind of private vehicle, whether it be electric or um, other. In terms of splitting the city into zones, um, I think that, again, fails to learn the lessons of elsewhere. The council loves to talk about um, how it's done in again. Uh, but it fails to mention that what Kent did was put in an awful lot of park and ride spaces first. Um, there just simply isn't that level of park and ride. I mean, indeed, the opposite of that, and car park spaces have been taken out. Um, so, segregating the city like that into different segments is actually going to make the situation worse, not better. Um, and we've already seen some of, um, some of the examples in the press where that's, that's caused issues. Uh, looking at Dunmar management, as mentioned in here, obviously, we've one form of demand management is um, closing lanes, which we've even touched on. Another form of demand management, of course, would be something like a congestion charge. No doubt the administration would say before May that they have no plans of that, much like they said they have no plans for clean air zone charge before the elections four years ago. Um, and I'm sure it's just coincidence that the cameras which were purchased with CAD also happen to be able to be used for a congestion charge at a future date if the administration so wished. Um, on page 94, it says under when talking about the tunnels. Um, one of the reasons the A38 needs to be changed is to the most congested road in the UK outside of London. Um, it therefore seems pretty astonishing that the solution to the most congested road is to close the most congested road and push all of that congestion onto neighbouring roads. Um, and I really do urge the council to look at that again. It, it strikes me that really the council is fundamentally missing the point there. Um, when Andy Stream talked about this to the press, it was really clear what the council needed to do was they need to get public transport in first. And that is exactly what needs to be done if you want to get people onto public transport. The way you do it is by putting in a good public transport system, not by removing the only means people currently have for many parts of the city to get into the city. Um, by removing roadways first and banning car journeys first, actually all you're doing is making it harder for many parts of the city to be able to access the city centre. Okay, I'll take all the questions first. Uh, yes, I'm on the... Okay, so um, at, a, at a high level, agree with an awful lot of what's in this strategy, but um, as always, the detail of process um, is very, very important. Um, and I'd first just like to actually pick up um, on the comment that Sir Alder just, just made. And indeed, the president's responses um, to this highlighted that what they most wanted to see um, was more trams, more segregated cycling. And of course, all the investment that's actually been completed so far on trams has not made any difference to your capacity to get in and out of the city. Now, I understand why it's been ongoing through the city centre, you need to put that infrastructure in. And in fact, you know, all the construction that's currently taking place will not do that until we actually get um, the um, line out through the east of the city and the line, line out on the Hagley Road, neither of which are funded yet. The tram is not, has not made any difference getting in and out of the city. Um, and on segregated cycle routes, yes, obviously we've got one or two of those, but we're so far away from having a network. And Again, on the east of the city, there's a significant amount of money being spent and construction to the A45 at the moment uh, to put the spring route in. Um, now, that route, the A45 is one of the few roads in the east of the city that is scheduled as in the plan to have a segregated cycleway. And yet, despite all that work being done on it at the moment, that cycleway isn't being put in at the moment. There's a huge missed opportunity there to actually deal with both issues at once and save a lot of money. Um, on the consultation as well, um, 
there's play made there about well there was a route for people who were not um internet engaged um to um to feed their comments back and i'd just like to know how many people actually did that but how many non-internet responses were there and then more broadly how many changes were made in response in the plan in response to the consultation um, I'd also like to stress the point about park and ride. Um, we need more park and ride, um, and there seems there's very little in this plan on that. Um, on the local travel section, um, so far we have 12 primary schools with uh, school streets projects, which is a um, little more than six dollars. You know, more than little, little more than um, a. a um, an interesting trial of it, but how are we actually going to scale that up um, and, and what are the plans to do? I'd be interested to, to know that. Um, and then this reference, um, and, and the cabinet member made reference in his remarks to moving to 20 miles an hour, um, which again, as an aspiration for residential streets, I fully support. However, the real, the actual practical issue at the moment is people just completely ignoring the speed limit. Um, and that was the reason we used that um, as our notice of motion for council. And I'm disappointed that there's very little about actually how we're going to enforce um, speeding um, in the plan. So that you know, clearly you can write have whatever limits you like, people have to completely ignore them, then they're not actually delivering what they're supposed to. And that this, in fact, there's a more dangerous, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I have a point that's associated with that, it's just frankly dangerous driving. Um, it's it's often remarked to people by, you know, too many like, people who come from other parts of the UK, stay, whatever, um, just how different the driving is in Birmingham, in parts of Birmingham, um, to, to where they're from, how much more dangerous it is, how much more speed it is. So we really need to ensure um, that, um, that people comply with the rules before we, as well as looking at changing those rules. And finally, um, given the fact that this is a very long term plan, um, I think there ought to be a little bit more consideration now the potential impact of autonomous driving. Um, that is, uh, no, we simply don't know even when that's um, likely to happen, but it seems to be getting pretty close. In number of companies that are, are working on this. Um, and um, if it does happen, the impact that would be absolutely huge. Um, you know, one of the bits of the plan talks about how, well, um, parking is the way to control the private drive car because every journey begins and ends with the car being parked. Well, that's, not, that's no longer the case if you've got autonomous driving. Um, and the, the financial benefits of autonomous driving are staggering much. I think they will drive it into existence. Um, and therefore I think we ought to be much more um, having much more attention in the plan to the potential impact of that and how we manage that. Thank you, Councillor Helmer. Councillor Lucky, over to you. Thanks very much for doing that. Yeah, just picking up a couple of points that Councillor Alden made. Um, certainly got a situation where I agree with, uh, obviously with uh, Council Welton where we have a situation where we're looking at reducing cars coming into the city whilst the public transport isn't there to back it up at the moment. We've got Andy Street who's talking to the government to try and get sort of 100 billion pounds, a billion pounds I should say, spent on the public uh, transport here in the city. Uh, and you can see the benefits of where it's led by the transport first, so you have um, Newcastle upon Tyne, which has got uh, underground going into the uh, city centre. You have uh, bus interchanges linking into that metro system all the way around. Uh, they have segmented off the city, but interestingly enough, um, they still allow people to go into park if they need to. But you find that when you give people general choice, they choose what's best for them. Newcastle hasn't decided that it needs a charging clean air system. And I think a good reason for that is because they have a public transport system that the residents of that area decide is suitable for them. And then the, and they, they use it. 
most of the car parks there have electric charging points, but most of them, you don't see that many cars there because there's the genuine system. If you look here at Birmingham, there is public transport, but it needs a lot of improvement on it. I would suggest that you get a public transport system in place, and then you give people a genuine choice. And if you have a genuine choice, people will use the public transport system to come in, and that will relieve some of the pressure on the roads coming into the city. Um, on the tunnels, uh, I'm lucky enough to go to council in 2014, and every transport plan, plan I've heard since becoming a councillor has has intimated about the tunnels closing and I'm reliably informed that before me they were talking about closing the tunnels. Um, the report has come out, the public has read it and they're reading it as the tunnels are going to close. There has then been um, cabinet members been doing a tour of the newspapers talking well you know it's just an aspiration we're not we're not uh, sure about what we're going to do we're going to have to think about it. Um, I just get the impression that, you know, the public looked at, they've read the report and they see what it says. Uh, I think most people realise that after May, there well may be a decision that those tunnels will close. I just think that in a bit of openness, transparency, and the fact that the residents are reading it and they see what's been said. I think now is an opportunity to go out and say, are you going to close the tunnels? Are you minded to close the tunnels? And if you're not, make it clear so people know what the future holds. Thank you very much, Bridget. Thank you. I'll just clear up a couple of points of factual accuracy, covering councillors at the back. Uh, so a statement was made that we decided to bring in a clean air zone. We were mandated by the government to bring in a clean air zone. It's the only way to get emissions down fast enough. Uh, and there's been an assertion that we, um, again, um, want to ban cars in the city centre. The report, if all pages have actually been read, makes it very clear that some people will always need cars for mobility reasons. So I just wanted to clear up a couple of points of factual accuracy uh, that run, have run contrary to what's actually in the report. Uh, so Councillor Hamilton, I'll bring you in. I wasn't going to speak on this subject, but I'll do the health aspect. We have already seen an improvement with the quality of um, the air in the city since we've introduced this. I know many people have tried to argue the point about people in these difficult um, residents and what have you. And I'm not saying residents haven't found this difficult, but they're adapting, they're getting used to it. It's, it's, it's far better what we are trying to do for people's health. Transition hurts. When you're trying to move from an old way of working where car, the car was dominant and you're moving to a new way of looking at the transport and the flow of transport around the city, it will hurt. But in the long term, the health effect, there will be a lot less um, lung conditions. People will be far more healthy because they will be using different forms of transport. And what is absolutely key here, we won't get the death that we have got in the past because of what the way that people, um, the, the transport system and the way people behave around this system. We have to start to work together if we are ever going to meet some of the aspirations of what is happening. It's COP26 in a few weeks. We have to start to work together. And to be honest, just trying to open underground tunnels and what have you, so that you find different ways of introducing the same problem. It's not the way forward for Birmingham. We have got to use new ways of working, and I absolutely believe the transport plan is trying to think out of the box. And for me, as somebody that has looked at health and is passionate about health, social care, and well-being, what we've tried to do is look at different ways of working, but it will be painful to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Um, I just wanted to add that over the summer months, I had the opportunity to visit um, a couple of schools that were located in, in, a, in a ring road. And um, it was really positive to have conversations with her teachers and teaching staff who actually come up with a reduction in the number of absences from children, particularly children who are uh, suffering mm -hmm. asthma and other respiratory diseases. Um, so, I think, as, as Councillor Hamilton said, it, it is a transitional process and we're needing to see a behavioural change on behalf of, of all our citizens. But I think there is much 
to again touch the green um, light in this report prior to the future. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Zappa, I'll thank you. Thank you. I'll try and respond to all the points um, as, as quickly as I uh, can. Um, Councillor, first of all, thank you for your positive points at the start of the statement. Uh, I absolutely support um, the reopening of local uh, train stations, and that's why CAS revenue uh, money has been allocated uh, to support the reopening of the investment that's gone to the stations. Uh, so we are absolutely backing that with, with, with investment. Um, I also welcome your comments about encouraging more people to water school. That's clearly one of the key aims of many of aspects of this uh, transport plan. Um, the A38 tunnels, there are absolutely no plans to close the A38 tunnels. But whilst we're discussing uh, the, uh, the future of our city, we're discussing the future of transport in our city, um, it would be uh, rather remiss of us not to talk about uh, a literally a motorway that runs through the heart of Birmingham. It's important to have a conversation. Uh, and one of the first things we will do is, is carry out some modelling about the use of those A38 tunnels today and the potential use of those, uh, potential traffic flow through those uh, A38 tunnels if other measures were to be taken. However, there are absolutely no plans to close the A38 tunnels. I just want to make that uh, perfectly clear. Uh, in terms of EV charging, um, we, we've got clear aspirations to deliver 394 fast rapid EV chargers by the close of 2023, uh, 2023 and uh, 3,600 by 2018. We're working very closely with our partners ESP uh, to be sure we can deliver that. Um, we've got catch up on, on, uh, on EV charging, but we're determined to do that as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of splitting the city into, into zones, um, that is in no way restricting anybody getting to any location in the city centre by car. There, there would be no area of Birmingham um, city centre or any of Birmingham that can car free other than the pedestrianised areas. And we, I think we're all supportive of increased pedestrianisation in key aspects of the city centre. We've seen how pedestrianisation has transformed Birmingham. Um, now, um, to, just to make it absolutely clear, there are no plans to bring in any form of congestion zone in Birmingham. That's before the election and after the election. And I, I, I totally disagree with what Councillor Alden said in terms of uh, we didn't tell the public about the clean air zones. There's a very, very clear commitment in the 2018 Labour Manifesto which says that Birmingham will consider, Birmingham Labour will consider introducing a clean air zone. It's a very, very clear term. And the other thing is, um, I think it would be helpful if the leader of the opposition had some uh, conversations with. Uh, conservative ministers who put it in writing, black and white, that they absolutely support and endorse the plans that Birmingham put forward to address the ministerial direction that they made. So the conservatives in Westminster support the Birmingham Clean Air Zone. I just want to make that very, very clear. And that will be put out in every single communication that we put out to reinforce this. And I think it's really important that we stop playing politics with people's lives. This is about reversing health inequalities. Again, not to leave the compliant levels of air quality, but again to save levels of air quality. So my children and our children as corporate parents who grow up in a city where they're not disadvantaged by air pollution, but advantaged because they live in a city with clean air. Um, I'm not going to take any lessons from Andy Street with respect to public transport. He's the mayor that oversaw half a mile of tram extension in the year. So his plans, I think Andy Street needs to very, very quickly look at his track record on public transport in this city. Moving on to what Councillor Harmer said, and I absolutely agree in terms of the uh, the, the, the failure um, of Andy Street to utilise the Metro Extension, so the Sprint project down the A45 to bring forward segregated side lane up down that corridor. There's a failure of Andy Street, he's obviously in that project because Birmingham City Council, and in particular myself, made it very clear, clear to his offices that that is a clear aspiration of ours. So he's got some questions to answer with respect to that. We are bringing forward, um, as we trial the pop-up cycle lanes during the, uh, the, the, during the emergency traffic run, we are bring, bringing forward, uh, making a lot of those uh, temporary pop-up cycle lanes more permanent uh, moving forward. Um, the the, the, the tram extension to the airport by the east of Birmingham will be a massive game changer. And I hope again, Andy Street, um, um, who's, who's, who's very friendly with Conservative ministers will be able to 
deliver that. And I know the Conservative government talks about leveling up. I tell you what, we can level up the level of investment that's going into transport in our city, because we're not seeing the right level of uh, investment uh, that that's going into transport in our city. The London Central Conservative government needs to get out of London and look at how they can invest into places like Birmingham and up north and ensure that we are leveling up transport. That, that's where they could start with their leveling up again, if they were absolutely committed to it. Um, uh, Roger, I'll get back to you in terms of the level of non-internet responses that was made to the consultation compared to the internet base. I think it's a valid point. We can always learn as a council to do more things um, um, that are face-to-face, -face, but obviously one of the challenges we had during this, uh, the consultation, um, was the actual pandemic itself kicking off during the, during, during the consultation itself. Um, on the school streets, we've delivered 12 school streets as far as you said. 11 of them were very successful. One, there's more lessons to be learned, and that was in the city centre. So there was a contradiction between a control parking zone there and, and, um, and uh, the school street project. There's another six being, at least six being rolled out uh, in the next few months. Uh, uh, I think we're all determined as a Labour administration to roll out as many school streets as possible. We, we know it's worked in other places. Uh, we, we know it will work in Birmingham, and it has worked in those that we roll out and make uh, our schools in the city a safer place for all those that travel to school, particularly our, our children. Um, in terms of autonomous driving, um, we've been, myself and uh, the leader, along with Phil Edwards, have had some conversations with uh, one of the leading uh, companies with respect to autonomous vehicles. We're, we're continuing to speak to them. Um, and we, we hope to be in a place where we can sign a mandate and stand for them and some of that, some of their work could be trialled in the city and our jobs can be created in the city for that. I think it's an interesting development moving forward and it's something that we will absolutely keep on. Keep on. Um, I think your comments about road safety, um, Roger, are well, well known. You mentioned the, uh, the, the, the motion that you brought forward. Um, uh, myself and Phil met with a police and crime commissioner last week to have exactly those conversations about how we can um, look at further rolling out the, um, the average speed enforcement cameras. So we've, we've started discussions with the police at the very, very highest level. I know that uh, Simon Foster would you to speak to the, uh, the Chief Constable with respect to this. Uh, so I will keep yourself and other colleagues aware and uh, have those discussions as well. Um, Councillor Mackie endorsed what Councillor uh, Oldman said. Um, so um, uh, I'll note your comments, Councillor Mackie, but they're largely useful. Uh, and thank you, Councillor Hamilton uh, and Councillor Francis, uh, for your comments around the, the, the improvements to the quality of air uh, since, since the government um, building was on. What I'll say is uh, compliance of the clean air zone is a better place than we expected. 80% um, of the vehicles that come through our clean air zone are, are cars. Uh, we're nearly at 90% compliance bonds. Uh, we have a challenge when it comes to hack and carriage vehicles. We have a challenge uh, when it comes to uh, a smaller challenge when it comes to black, uh, black cabs when it comes to vans. We're going to see how we can utilise some of the resources that we've got to support them. So uh, we're absolutely committed to, to getting the clean air zone right. So this, um, this project is about, uh, we always said the clean air zone is started with journey, and this is about uh, taking them level. The final point I'll make is, uh, Chair, this is a council uh, that knows that the population in our city will increase. We know there's 150,000 people expected to be burned by 2021. If they come to the city, and they continue the car culture that we've got uh, over lines of car, particularly on shorter journeys, 300,000 car journeys every single working day, less than one mile. That is the challenge about the city. If we don't convert some of those journeys to walking, cycling, and public transport, we'll be a gridlock city where hundreds more will be dying every year because of air pollution. And this is what this Labour Council is trying to address here with this Birmingham Transport Plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, and change isn't easy, um, but I think what's being said now here is it's something quite visionary for the future, but it's going to address head on some of those issues that are coming down the pipeline for us uh, in some bits of the city, but in some bits of the city we are living with right now. Um, change isn't easy, uh, but this is the whole way forward, and uh, it's, it's what we need to be seeing. So with that, I'm going to ask Cabinet, we've got uh, recommendation 2.1 or 2.2 in front of us. Are those agreed? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Right, we're on to item number eight. Item number eight is the Education and Skills Transformation Programme, including Send Improvement and Home School Transport. 
will have a minor amendment to 2.1, and that is to add to the end of uh, recommendation 2.1 with final decision on the posts created to be delegated to the DCS in consultation with the cabinet member for vulnerable children and families and the cabinet member for finance. So that's a minor uh, addition to, uh, to recommendation 2.1, that wording in a moment. Uh, but otherwise, I will hand over to Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So this report talks about the uh, transformation that we are proposing to take place in the education skills area of uh, work, particularly around SEND and other areas associated to that. And as we all know, there's a definite need for improvement and investment into that area. And we've seen it's been well documented um, over the last few years. The commitment this council is giving towards our vulnerable children and their families across this city cannot be a commitment that is only done in words. It has to be a commitment that's also given through resources also. And it's fair to say that as part of that transformation, you almost need to go to a place of recovery, in a sense, and making sure that basic things are in place that's needed to drive some of that improvement forward. So we're proposing that we bring this money forward so that we can start that some of that work and the officers can get on with some of that work, but also to acknowledge the fact that we do have a new DCS that will be coming to Birmingham and we will need to make sure that she has the right staffing and resources and support around her to not just make this a council-led journey, but to make sure that this is a city-wide-led journey improvement um, across not just the SEND part, but across the whole directorate in its entirety. It is ready for a refresh. It needs a, a refresh. We're going through modern times, not just the difficulties that the services have had, but also we need to make it fit for purpose for Birmingham, for the children that are living in the city now and the ones that will be in the future. Um, we're also acutely conscious that we also have a commissioner that has been appointed to Birmingham to work alongside us and the improvement board. And we need to make sure that those steps are in place, so that we make sure that we've got the money to commit to so both the things that are in the accelerated action plan, which is with the DFB at the moment, um, that we can honour those commitments and have the resources and staff to drive those conversations and that work forward. Um, so I think I'll leave it there, Chair, and just I'm sure that we have questions, so I will take questions as well. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Councillor Chatfield, you have indicated. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things I wanted to um, highlight, really, um, which is work we do, we've sit for around a couple of areas of the budget. Um, so firstly, there is a sufficiency review being undertaken to um, to make sure we have a proper understanding of the requirements of the service area. We did a similar exercise um, with uh, the previous neighbourhoods director of last um, last early into this year um, and we'll be doing the same with this um, director now so we have a proper um, handle on, on what the sort of budget um, requirements of the service area are going forward and doesn't the work and the other element there supporting us uh, with again it's referencing reports do some work um, alongside the LJ as well around making sure we have a proper understanding of what's going on with the high needs block um, there is a, a a different situation in Birmingham in terms of the high needs block and an underspend on the high needs block um, and we're doing a piece of work to understand why that is the case um, and what, um, what steps could or could possibly can be taken around that in terms of supporting the wider um, departmental spend. That's I think just wanted to clarify. Thank you. And um, Councillor Francis, did you want to know? Thank you. Um, to you. Um, is it for, I, I've read the paper as we read the paper with um, you, and there's a lot in here and I don't need to go to It's a big final trust. But I think the investment is absolutely vital in order to make sure that the service um, within the directorate is absolutely perfect and uh, we will be able to direct the services as heads of time to the and the resources to get into the job and to deliver the kind of improvements that we need to see across the directorate. So um, it has that effect. Thank you. Right. Any comments, uh, comments or questions? Councillor Alden. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, start here because it ties in with what I raised earlier on, on the media term financial plan update. Um, so I do welcome the change to 3.1 in terms of programs and cabinet and the oversight line. I was to say something I raised in the earlier report. Um, I, I think it's a shame it's only in consultation rather than cabinets actually delegating the decision to process to the um, cabinet members. 
but that is a welcome um, move to what would otherwise be in the board in terms of membrane size. So I think that is good. Uh, turning to 3.18, um, something that does really only almost say it's passing in the report, um, but it is quite an astonishing change, although actually I think a welcome one, um, is the admittance by the council that they're going to be outsourcing the service to either a local quality training company, CIC, um, or a trust. And um, I mean, this is good for the parents, it's great for the children, the service, frankly, who are being left down for far too long. But it is hugely embarrassing for a council who previously refused to look at this option when it's being traded. Um, I mean, members will remember when we first raised the idea that the council should set up a children's trust. Um, we suggested that would, would include all the services, including SMD. Um, when the council did finally set up a children's trust, we again said that it really ought to include SMD as well, instead of that being taken out of the council and assisted, they could do it better. So it's welcome the council finally realising that, that actually, in all the years it says it's been in prison services, we've been failing their children, it's time to read the children first by doing what's best for their service provision rather than um, doing otherwise. So uh, that is a, a welcome change, but an interesting one that it's, it's tucked away in your report rather than shouted loudly about. Um, in terms of the update transformation, it's been really useful to, because it wasn't clear from reading, um, what's actually being done over the last six years to, to deliver the improvements, because the only sort of finite thing that we I could see in here is the rebranding exercise that had been completed. Nothing else seemed to have been completed, it seemed to be in motion. And um, so the use of it, we could perhaps get some clarity on is there any other steps that are actually that work has now been completed. In terms of the, the money um, being spent, obviously, um, you know, we know a lot of money has been spent as a department in the past. Since April 2019, it's been on 2.3 million on consultants, 1.4 million on interests. Um, and yet, you know, two years later, we are exactly where we are here. And I think there's going to be real concerns about what this new injection of money is, is spent more wisely to why that member oversight is so important. Um, but the report also doesn't seem to pick up the issue of the lack of, frankly, specialist provision that's needed in the city. Um, and it's interesting new that the amount that's now being committed to another 6.8 million roughly. Um, if the council had bid into the free school let's the end of um, funding that was made available by the government, the council didn't bid for, the average new SNB school provision is 5.8 million that's being looked at. So we're actually spending more than it costs to provide a whole new school purpose built for this um, service. We really need to, need to make sure that money is properly spent and frankly should really be looking again at, at when this money is available bid in to buy new provision um, which the council does indeed look to bid for it. And that picks me up to something on page 196 I wanted to touch on um, again to do with funding. So at the bottom of 5.3 the very last line um, or last two lines sorry it talks about there's an spend on high needs block um, that's being looked to be reallocated yes in transformation. Um, I'm curious if someone could just explain how there is a understanding of this service. I, I thought Council had already decided to spend and um, take away some of that money to pay off the debt on the main school funding block. So it'd be interesting to know um, if the council's actually understand that because it says that there is literally nothing it can spend that money in the service or it's made a decision to cut funding there so it can use it in other parts of the council. Um, if someone could perhaps give some clarity on whether that is a uh, there's nothing we can spend it on, or well, actually we've made a cut there so we can use it elsewhere. Um, Turning to page 247, that uh, talks about the primary three, sorry, it's a lot of pages that skip forward the entirety. And um, the third bullet point on page 247 talks about um, bringing DBS process in house. And um, this is something we would very much welcome. I know it's only down here as a possible option, but we would very much set them to be brought in house. Clearly, something that should have been doing years ago. Um, it's got a cost against it. I'd just like that actually other councils do recoup that cost. Um, so you'd be able to recoup that cost. So I do hope you look at that as well. And this is something that you can just place on the provider to have to buy your provision. Um, so that can actually be cost beautiful. So it's something that just for you to, to go away and look at. Um, and, and you'll see there's been a common theme all the way through this. So really, we need to, we, we're very supportive of additional money being put into it. So you need to make sure it's being spent right. And key to that really is going to be the resource plan, I guess. Um, so I was quite surprised by a couple of things um, I saw in the resource plan, particularly when um, I remember mentioned 
Um, not not cover member of this report. The material didn't cover member, I mentioned they read it twice in the last couple of days. Um, when you open up the, the resource plan, page two of it gives a document title and it says it's the housing management and capital investment and repairs improvement program resource plan. Um, not the uh, SEMD and Home School Transport Resource Plan. Um, and then when you turn down to section five on page 259, um, again, uh, section five, title, resource plan, first line, deliver the changes and improvements to housing management and the capital investment and repair service. And what strikes me from that is that either this is a cut and page report that has had sections changed from another um, area of the council altogether, or it really hasn't been looked at very carefully to make sure that it is actually relevant to what has been proposed. Now, other bits we clearly do talk about um, SND service, but it is perhaps just an example of the lack of attention to detail that's too often been shown. Um, and it is, of course, the children who use the service who end up suffering from that. So I really do hope going forward that um, the required attention to detail will be shown to ensure that this money is spent to actually improve the life chances of people. Thank you. I pause there for a quick reality check because uh, there was a statement about section 3.18 uh, on the main report. I don't believe it is entirely accurate. Um, and that was regarding um, the decision to outsource the work, the, um, work of this directorate to a trading authority, a local authority trading company or a CIC. Uh, the way that that is worded, um, I think, could be misinterpreted. Uh, the sentence states that following poor performance in some other authorities, they have taken a decision to deliver their services in such a way. Um, that is not a decision that's necessarily been taken here yet, uh, but that is the way that uh, others have decided to do this. Uh, before we move on. Right, I'm going to take any other comments first, and I'll bring you back on everything. Uh, so, Councillor Hummer, over to you. Yeah. Um... Thank you, Deputy Leader. I mean, my, my family is a family with a large number of teachers in it. Um, and when I talked to them about this, this topic, um, and actually one of the things they're most concerned about, and I, I'm hoping that this work will really dig into um, quite a, a fine level, is the large amount of um, children with special education needs who are not identified as such. Um, quite often um, because um, their parents want uh, their children to be tarnished with that um, and uh, with that label, uh, which is clearly very unfortunate because that then deprives them of the support that they need and then has a huge impact on other children um, being educated alongside them who um, you know, suffer from um, disruption and so on, but uh, children with, with those needs not getting the support they need and have on, on, um, on a class. So I really hope that um, we really do a deep dive into that and really get to the bottom of what totally need is, even though that potentially obviously then puts extra demands on, on costs, but until we really understand the full nature of the problem, um, we're, we're, we're at risk of not having great strategies out there. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. So uh, I've got three people to bring back. I've <laughs> got Councillor Thompson, I've got Councillor Chatfield, and I've got um, Kevin as well. I can bring you in on some of those points. Should we great start with Kevin? Um, do you want to pick up some of the uh, drafting issues? Um, yeah. So, so part of the drafting issues is that as we use the standard template, we can change the title. And uh, I'll just do that. So, let's see. And the content of the document is all about education and transformation. This is a substantial document. So, uh, that, uh, hold our hands up. It's an officer there. In terms of the number of uh, special schools in the city, uh, work is being undertaken on a sufficiency strategy, which is an essential document we need to determine whether we should be building more special schools. The direction of travel for special education needs across the country is to try and provide more uh, support to children in mainstream schools. So you have to have a balance between the two. The sufficiency strategies, the key piece of work we do is try and find out what that balance is. 
that's part of the work that's uh, going to be completed on this, this, this project. Um, uh, just to reaffirm, the message in the report is that the commissioner will be liberty to advise the Secretary of State, so the Minister, uh, if he thought that our services should be managed in a different way. I can tell you it's been the full plan of your interim director and offices and cabinet member and the chief executive that we are determined to prove to the Commissioner that we're putting in place the project plan, project management and resources to make sure we can stabilise and improve the service. And indeed, through the back to basics approach that we have been doing over the past three months, there is some slow signs of improvement of service. And the more we get the staffing to set out, the more we've been able to deal with direct queries of children, uh, children's parents, and carers. So it's an early start. But it is our full intention to demonstrate to the Commissioner, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the Director, Sue Harrison. Um, that Birmingham is a city that can manage effectively its own city services. So that's, that's what I'm And from the day I was interviewed for this job, I have been quite intrigued by Birmingham Simon's blog. It's probably the trend. The majority of uh, areas of the country, when I'm on this blog, is under uh, tremendous pressure and in many cases overspending. Because of the way the service is configured, it, it could be that there's some that need to be not identified. Is that is possible? But again, you know, parents have to go through the system. That is possible, but I don't know. I can't confirm that. Um, but what we do know at the moment is something is slightly different at the moment as well. The deficit that is being paid back isn't to the DSG, the mainstream schools, it's the deficit that had acquired on the high needs block in the two years prior to the government's increase in funding. The so there's a deficit that I think is 15 million that is being paid off in five million this year, nine million to go over the next two years. So in addition to an underspend, the high needs block has also got the understanding paying back a deficit. This is highly unusual, which is why we've asked the LGA to do some comparative work. Um, I have said a number of meetings I spent on this work is done, the high needs block will come under pressure as in everywhere else in the country. That's what I suspect. Um, we're trying to get, uh, looking at Magnus Block, is, is some funding in Magnus Block was being used to support the statutory services in the authority. And that's why we had to do a rebalance and budget and put five million into the general fund. So there's another five million in the Magnus Block. What we're hoping to do is that with the advice of LGA, we will be able to put more funding quite rightly as the Magnus Block. And we'll begin to refocus the high needs block on what it's intended to do, which is to meet children's uh, needs, whether in mainstream or in special. So there is something, something we need to fully understand before we make any further decisions. So I apologise for the time for the plan and send these. Uh, DBS in the house, so we're doing the options appraisal, and it could well be in council that the, the cost is different. But we are we need to do this is with the I've always worked. We need to do a proper options appraisal. What does it cost for bringing in house? And how is it managed? And there, there potentially is a cost and that you have to have staff to look over that. Now, whether that can be integrated in HR business as usual will be the discussion between uh, us and the director. But I mean fact, we haven't seen the, and I can say another way, the, the fact that the contractors as a whole have not complied with which on paper is a reasonable system, they do one bit share with the other. That option of us checking every DBS, which you can now do when new badges are collected, is probably the best thing that we can do. Um, but, but I need I need to do work to make sure you understand how that will be organised out of cost. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go to Kristen Chatfield next. Uh, I think to be honest, Kevin answered the question behind these block uh, far yeah. better than I did, so I think we'll leave it there. <laughs> That's uh, fine. So I'm just going to do a quick clarification on the uh, which I meant to bring up before on the amendment. Um, so the reason it is worded in that way, to my understanding, is in line with the constitution on delegations and how those are allowed to be carried out, which is the reason it is worded that it will be the DCS in consultation with the cabinet member. We don't have to delegate the authority to cabinet members. There's quite a lot of decisions in here which are operational, which is to do with resources in our office and member protocol in part C5 of our constitution, which is in line with the LGA guidance. 
clearly says that operational and managerial decisions reserved for officers. Obviously, members initiate, direct, and provide oversight, but they do not you know, have the decision making um, in relation to their operational and managerial decisions. So that is the reason for that wording. Uh, on that, I'll bring back Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. I think actually Kevin and Sam um, we talked quite a lot about some of the to say. Um, but, um, just, just to reiterate, actually, that we have made this commitment and we do need to make sure that we at least put the funding available for that. Um, you know, by the sounds of things, it's almost as if we want to be rigid in how we're going to do that. But we cannot be, if we are making a commitment to the city around co production, if we're making a commitment to um, schools. About the way that we're going to work and listen to them in order to inform our decision making, and also the commitment that we have as an organisation, and some of us personally made to the, the um, commissioner that we will work alongside them and make sure that we will make sure it's connected decision making on some of these areas. Sometimes when you're a little bit too rigid, it means it doesn't give you flexibility to pick up things that might come up down the track which always happens when you're going through an area of transformation. So the key thing is that I, I hope that Cabinet are minded to follow the um, recommendations and that we can actually get on with the work of supporting because ultimately, no matter how many conversations we have in this room or other rooms, there are children out there that desperately need us to get this right so that they can have the provision that they need to live a successful and happy and secure, comfortable lives as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, I know if the leader was here, he would want to reiterate his personal commitment to this agenda as well. Welcome to Councillor Thompson uh, to putting this service right. Uh, I'm not seeing any more hands, uh, so I'm going to move to recommendations. So we've got recommendation 2.1 to 2.4 in front of us with the addendum to 2.1 uh, that the decision be taken in by the BCS in consultation with the cabinet member for children's wellbeing and the cabinet member for uh, finance and resources. So with that amendment to 2.1, uh, are the recommendations agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Right, uh, the next item is item nine, domestic abuse, part four, domestic abuse, Act 2021, new duty on local authority. Uh, Councillor John Cotton, over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, this report seeks retrospective approval of a 3.26 million grants from the, the newly named now uh, BLUHC, another acronym to get used to, uh, to support discharge of our new duties under Part 4 of the Domestic Abuse Act 2021. Um, as a new duty that's been placed upon uh, local authorities, uh, details will be set out in 3.2 of the reports, but the, the headlines of that are that we have a duty to ensure that all victims of domestic abuse have access to the right support within safe accommodation when they need it, and also to appoint a multi-agency partnership board to drive and develop our, our strategy in response to domestic abuse. We've actually had that in place for some time here, but we set up a shadow board where the parts of the, the act went into effect. Uh, I'd like to just take this moment actually to thank Kirk, Councillor Nicky Brennan, who's been chairing that board, and also the partners who've been making a really important contribution uh, to its work. The reason this is a retrospective uh, report is, well, frankly, we, we had a few issues getting some clarity out of governments over what this grant could be used for. Um, councils like our own are really keen to try and use some of this to support preventative activity, not just crisis support. Um, we finally received advice that government would only allow us to use it for crisis interventions. Um, so, obviously, anything that helps to strengthen the system when we are facing real demand for support around domestic abuse is welcome. But he's a little bit disappointed that we can't use tools to develop more preventative uh, long term approaches as well. Because uh, I think all that work we need to do around challenging and changing attitudes is really important as, as, as part of this. Those constraints have also shaped the commissioning approach as well. So we've had to uh, approach this by modifying some of our existing contracts and also set some money aside to make grant awards as well. The other thing that's rather disappointing is that this, this funding is only for one year. Um, we know that uh, what we've seen over the course of the pandemic and afterwards is there's been significant increases in reports of domestic abuse and significant increases in the need for, for that crisis support. And it's also demonstrated <coughs> for effective prevention and intervention. So whilst the money is always welcome to be able to put into services, frankly, one year funding pot isn't enough uh, to meet the needs. We do need some sustained investment going forward. And that's certainly a case that we'll be continuing to, to make. 
Thank you. Any comments or queries? Councillor Mackey. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, well, um, I thought this was a positive report, but <laughs> just after hearing that, I was a bit, oh, um, well, from the south and the group, anyway, we, we uh, welcome the legislative focus in this area and we welcome the £3.2 billion pounds that the government is giving uh, to uh, support the council in its duties here. And I think, you know, saying that we have to shut the board there, I'm sure that that £3.2 million pounds could be used by the government says, but seeing we would have the shadow board anyway, hopefully some of the cash that they were spending could be moved in other more preventative areas. Um, I mean, positively, you know, money coming in here, there was one, one question I was going to ask, was that um, domestic violence is overwhelmingly uh, male or female, so I can understand why the report is very heavy on that. Um, you know, domestic violence does exist in the same sex, Couples and stigma itself means this is very difficult for it to be reported. Uh, and I was just hoping that we might have some sort of commitment to say that the strategy will sort of look at this area as well and not lose sight of it. Uh, so sort of that's uh, the thing that we could do. Thank you. Not seeing any other hands, so I'll bring Councillor Costa back. <laughs> Thanks, um, and th thanks for the, the, the support for the overall thing that we're trying to, to do here, Ewan, and uh, if, you, if you can help us in turn my uh, twisting government's arm to, to commit to multi-year funding, that would also be very welcome. Um, just on your specific points uh, around uh, same-sex couples and um, the, the, the gendered nature of the domestic abuse, you're quite right, it, overwhelmingly it is, is male perpetrators and, and, and female victims of uh, domestic abuse, but we do know that there are some, some other groups that are affected. We've traditionally always commissioned services uh, from this council to, to ensure that there is provision for, for other victims of domestic abuse. And actually part of the work of the, the partnership board we've established an equalities panel. So we ensure that everything that we are committing next the equalities needs of the city as well. So we pick up those issues through. Thank you. Okay, not seeing any other hands. Uh, so we'll move on to are those agreed? Thank you. Okay, uh, two more and then we'll take, actually let's do one more and then we'll take a comfort break because we are running uh, a little bit behind. So uh, item 10 is contract extension request for commissioning of Vernon Carers Hub, uh, Councillor Hamilton. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Leader. That's what we do. Right, I am pleased to be presenting this report to Cabinet seeking an extension to the contract for one year from April 10, 20, 1st of April 2022 to 31st of March 2023. The contract was originally awarded in July 2019 as highlighted in paragraph 1.1. Throughout the two years, the carers' home has been performing at a very high level and was well on the way to delivering the contractual requirements. In some instances, actually delivering more than was expected of it. But unfortunately, due to COVID, COVID came along, it had to actually change the direction of travel. And the, um, the hope has then has, has seen a rapidly increasing numbers of carers who have registered or needed to seek support and advice and access to food banks, responding to advice for carers and seeking um, a vaccine. Now, through, throughout the COVID, throughout COVID, services became very flexible. And as you know, we've adapted to the circumstances. We've had very positive feedback for online services such as Yolda. And the hub has worked with large numbers of family, families, but unfortunately, because of the way that redesign is working and the way we've had to um, work around um, dementia and the small grants pathway, it's providing, it's providing many challenges. So it's meant that we've had to put this contract back. The one year extension, it will provide the opportunity for the carers hub to fully deliver. What the original, what they originally wanted to commission, such as the dementia group providing time and focus on current service and, and delivery through services um, that they can fully then develop. The Birmingham Carers Hall is part of a joint procurement commissioning service. 
for young for young people and for mental health carers. Both the young carers and mental health carers contracts are seeking a two years extension, which would enable a joint procurement and true partnership working with Birmingham's Children's Trust and Birmingham and Solihull Clinical Clinical. Let me get this right. Clinical commissioning group. Can I ask Cabinet to approve the extension of this contract? If there are any questions, now is the time of referral. Repeat back to the Secretary. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Looks like everyone's holding their peace. Okay. <laughs> going, going, go on. <laughs> Lovely. We have agreement. I think this is our first, our first item. You just don't know how much we agree. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't give me a With that, um, we have right in front of us recommendation at two point one. Is that agreed with us? Agreed. 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 Lovely. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll take a 10 minute comfort break now. So if you can all be back here for uh, 45 or 11 minutes, uh, that'd be great. Thank you.
Lovely. Right, welcome back everyone to part two of the cabinet meeting. Uh, we are on agenda item 11, which is approval of three to zero next stage business case. Back to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this cabinet report builds upon the work undertaken since the final emergency declaration back in 2019 and sets out the next steps in the council's journey to becoming a net zero carbon organisation and supporting the city's move to net zero carbon. The report outlines the next stage business case and seeks approval of this. The key aspects within this are establishing a dedicated route to zero team led by an AD to take forward the council's work on carbon reduction and to secure funding for this area of work with the aim of the team in the South London within two years. Approval to progress the wave one projects, which are in accordance with the January action plan. Approval <coughs> of the strategic framework used for the appraisal and definition of route to zero projects. And the approval to undertake further works to define and confirm the role of the council in its commercial approach to defining and delivering its route to zero portfolio. Um, uh, in conclusion, I'll just say the approval of the next stage business case, and in particular the creation of the route to zero team, is essential in taking this piece of work forward uh, and significantly enhancing the City Council's work on carbon reduction. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. A hugely important paper, particularly with COP26, moving ahead of us. Any comments or queries? Uh, Councillor Arlen, Councillor Thank you, Leader. Uh, I very much welcome this report. Um, I mean, if we have uh, yet another reason why this is so important, the current stresses and strains being caused by um, our remaining dependency on fossil fuels, um, as opposed to a more sustainable model where we would be um, dependent on um, renewables um, in you know, the current situation just stress that. Um, on the detail of the report, um, I think my one concern is the 100% switch to grant funding um, in you know, you at year three. Um, and just the, the concern there is that in the sort of full first really full year the teams together, but a lot of their work may then end up practically in terms of um, chasing grants. Uh, and that then, if that isn't fully really successful, what then happens? So, um, you know, that may potentially lead to a distortion of priorities um, and then some vulnerability to the team if, if not fully really successful. So, just like some reassurances that that's not the case. But I say overall, very much welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Council. Thank you. Um, just wanted to pick up on page 13. Um, in the, the plan, appendix one, um, a couple of the bits in three and three and being four, they've got some of the baseline um, 2021-22 data not available um, at the moment, uh, or one of them, uh, says it's included with another one, so I can break that. Um, so is that information going to be made available? If so, when? And will that be circulated separately rather than having to wait until the end of the year report for that information to become available to Thank you. Uh, Councillor Zappa, can we bring you back? Thank you. Thank you for the, the comments. Um, Councillor Martin, I'm absolutely giving assurance that um, I'd like to see this team expand over the coming years. And I can you know, this is an important aspect of the work of this council and this city um, and society in general going forward. So I can absolutely give you assurance that um, the, the team won't spend uh, first year chasing grants and we'll make sure that the right room is also there for them to move forward. Um, Bobby, I would love to come back to you uh, with respect to your point and I hope to do that later today. And let's see in on the consists. The data that's not available on page 13. Can you just clarify, is that in the next stage business case itself or the next case to it? Yeah, the next stage business case itself. So I'll get a page we actually got from the pack. Um, page 329 of the whole pack. It's going to uh, waste and energy supply. That's it. We'll come back to you. That's why the one is on the page there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or queries? Okay, 
to my lemon is up next. So this is case new build depot for the relocation of Montague Street and Redburn Road depots at the Swerks. Uh, Councillor O'Shea. Uh, thank you, David Leader. Uh, this marks yet another step in our improvement of the inspection service. As we're aware, we've uh, spent £10 million already on replacing part of the vehicle fleet. There's more of that to come. Uh, we are investing in redeveloping our pre bar site at the moment, and we spent an extra £7 million uh, in getting our street clean over the course of this year. Uh, one of our next steps is to combine uh, two of our existing depots, the Redfern Road Depot and Montague Street Depot. And put onto a brand new site, uh, quite close to the Redfern Road site, which is known in the former Atlas Works in Tisley. Uh, this will replace two very tired sites that are really no longer fit for the future of the service. It will provide a modern working environment for our people, uh, will reduce the cost of maintenance, and will even see some reuse by taking stuff actually used elsewhere and use on this new site. Uh, we expect to go to the in the autumn. And uh, complete works on site by the end of next year. Uh, I'll ask the Cabinet to approve this uh, uh, report. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Alden. Thank you. Um, when this originally came forward, um, see there was the ERDF funding available as well, but the report projected originally, um, as the Cabinet members touched on. But we raised the uh, concern that there was a risk this could be seen as the council had introduced um, charters and vehicles and then instead of upgrading its fleet, just simply moving its fleet outside of the zone so it doesn't have to pay those um, fees, and which obviously an option not available to many businesses in the city. Um, and we were told at the time that no, absolutely, this was a key part of upgrading the fleet. Obviously, what's now clear from this report is that that doesn't appear to be the case anymore. Um, Appendix 208.3. Um, says the council will not be delivering the 40 rapid charge points um, anymore at this point, which I think is concerning. And, and the issue with the grant appears to be because actually we won't have um, the fleet uh, running on, a, on electric, which seems to be a requirement of the grant um, in sufficient time to, to meet the, the funding issues. And it raises the point with the original report that came forward, the outline business case, of how. Um, the targets that were required to be able to hit that grant funding weren't known at that point because it was available information. So presumably we would have, um, if we'd looked into the, those detailed targets, known actually that at the time it originally came to cabinet, that funding wouldn't be available because the project wasn't going to meet those targets. Um, so it, it raises a query there as well. Um, and frankly, I, I really hope the council will go away and actually find a way of being able to put in the electric charging instruction here, because it is clear that the council scheme does need to um, get electrified, and it's taking incredibly long time to do that. Um, this, sadly, if it goes forward as it currently seems to be, um, is only going to slow down that process of electrifying and being not speed it up. Okay, any other comments? No? Uh, Councillor O'Shea, back to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, when, when this report was produced, we were, we were looking at alternative fuels for our fleet. Uh, that's put out there as part of the um, request for a bidding when we renewed the fleet, and we had no opportunity in the context when we need new fuels. Um, we are frankly struggling to find vehicles that meet our requirements that would also support uh, alternative fuels. That will carry on. I can assure, assure the cabinet and everybody else that our intention to change the fuel of our vehicle is ongoing. Uh, whether it will be electric, whether the future of hydrogen is yet to be made clear, but uh, the works will be, be um, ready to take an upgrade to electric should be required as we install the paddy bar, as we install with all the depots. Uh, moving this site is not about getting the uh, escaping our, our uh, DPs under the clean air zone. Uh, as the vehicle fleet is replaced, uh, it will be Euro 6, so it will all be compliant over the next few years. Uh, as you'll know, we had a piece of cabinet last, last time around which we were talking about um, some of our parked vehicles, and those are going to electric. So the, that, that move will, will continue, uh, and our vehicle will all be compliant in that zone. Uh, moving out to the Montague Street site is a large site for housing development. I'm sure you'll be encouraged. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other 
comments? Do you want to come back on that? So, uh, so with that, we've got in front of us the recommendations 2.1 to 210. Lots of recommendations on this one. Uh, are those agreed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, next up is item 13, sale of land at Lawson Street, Birmingham, B4718. Uh, the leader would be introducing this one, uh, but in his absence, I am. So this is uh, seeking authority for sale of surplus council land at Lawson Street uh, by way of 250 year lease. Currently uh, very unproductive land, uh, given the scale of developments in the immediate vicinity of land we previously uh, disposed of around there. We anticipate becoming much more productive land uh, and the particular that set out in the report. So are there any questions on any of that? Councillor Mackey. Um, thanks very much, Bridget. There's a couple of points I had with this one. Um, I'm, keen, I'm from the report, I can see the purchaser looks keen as being very supportive uh, in looks of the purchase. I suspect, I don't know, uh, that um, some sort of housing is being looked at on this site. And I'm just wondering if uh, we looked at some form of outside uh, outline planning on this, if that's the case, it's going to come to some sort of housing. We looked at putting outline planning on the site and see if we can do that to try and sort of sweat the asset a bit more, get some more value out of it. Um, and the other comment I was going to make was just really around uh, openness and transparency. I can understand why there's a private report with this on the commercially sensitive nature of some of the numbers, but I don't really understand that if why the actual name of the person who's going to buy the land is at this stage private. I would have thought as open, transparent council, I think that probably should be open to all the members of the public to know who we're considering selling the land to, because I think that that then just to shine the light on, on what we're doing and if anyone wants to make a comment about it, it could where now people will only know who wants to buy the land once the decision has been made and they purchase it. I don't see why there's a commercial interest in giving that secret. So my understanding is the name of people buying it is actually listed under 1.1 and 2.1 in the public reports. Oh, there you are. I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Always happy to be of service. Um, on some of the others, I'll turn uh, even now, uh, if, uh, since you've done the hard yards on this. Is there anything you wanted to come back on? Uh, there's a number of options so in terms of this particular site, um, but we feel in this case the capital receipt is the best way to go. Obviously, doing a full review of all of our property assets as well, but, and looking at the option of doing more direct delivery on. Um, but this particular site ended itself to a, a capital receipt and doing a direct disposal of the development. Thank you. So answer that. Sorry, Thank you. Um, no issue for the um, report. Really, just a comment. I guess for future um, asset sales when they're coming forward, uh, you know, it's always worth I think as as having an idea of, of what we might value a site as under different uses compared to the existing use when we're sort of considering what, what the best value is. Thank you. We can make that up. Okay, uh, any, lots of any other hands? Uh, so we'll move to recommendations then. Uh, we have in front of us recommendations 2.1 to 2.4. Are those agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, item 14 uh, is next. Portley Park Wheel Site uh, Development Strategic Business Case Update. Uh, I'm going to Councillor Champion for this. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. So this is in the leader's absence, uh, presenting this report regarding the Boards of Park site and formerly known as Wheels. Um, so essentially, let's go through, um, members will be aware of the background to this site and the necessity um, of development on the site, not least the removal of knotweed, which also this report authorises to spend um, to remove that. So um, 2.1, a note of progress on proposals to bring forward development of Boards of Park. Uh, in accordance with the Bordley Park Area Action Plan adopted by the City Council on January the 14th, 2020. Um, and note that this is, of course, um, we are still awaiting the outcome of the levelling up front bid, which I'm largely informed um, will be anytime soon. Um, anytime soon seems to be a bit of a movable feast, but um, we are expecting some of the government uh, sometime uh, in this year. Um, in the event of an unsuccessful bid, however, the Council will progress the remediation of the site addition of services infrastructure with the intention of recovering these costs from the subsequent disposal of the sites. 
and it approves the release of the funding of 1.2 million to progress the development of the site, particularly through the procurement of uh, Japanese knockwood removal, underlying site investigation, securing the site, and ongoing security. Uh, and there are a number of other recommendations, but with that, I will move the report. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and obviously, we we raised council meetings and previous council meetings the really valuable um, services the community um, trust that women wheels have provided to um, the city over the years, and obviously the role they really should be playing in the future going forward. Um, this report really raises two questions. The first is I understand that they have applied and um, purchased the site as an asset community bank feels like. Um, the council would be prudent in talking off making any final decisions until actually it's seen the outcome of that application, um, rather than plowing ahead um, with the eviction um, of the tenants on the site. The other question that it, this report poses, um, and we didn't really get answers to the written questions or all questions we put the council last week either, was around the obligations that are placed on the council from the Birmingham development plan. Um, so, Within um, policy GA7, which the um, obviously the inspectors obligation made really clear that the council must ensure that there's even protection and enhancement on existing sites or they find alternative sites for Birmingham Wheels Birmingham Wheels is removed. What seems to be clear from, from the answer we've had so far is that actually the council isn't helping ensure that they move first before they're being Closed down and evicted, but rather has, has put them in the direction um, of retailers of, of land, not actually really doing much more than that. Um, to me, that doesn't feel like it meets the requirements of the BDP, where it's pretty clear that the Birmingham real site is protected, enhanced, or, or relocated. Um, and the way the council is going ahead currently, this group will be put out of business before any relocation ever happens. Which means they'll be lost to the city, which is something that the BDP went to great lengths to ensure wouldn't happen. Um, so, really, would urge the council to look at this again so we can ensure that Birmingham Wheels get the protection they needed, either on a, as they proposed, a reduced um, footprint within the current site or on an alternative site in the city, um, as the BDP puts forward as an option. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harvard, to you next. Yeah, um, just maybe. Um, <laughs> I'm not being at the cabinet meeting that we discussed, but there's a bit more clarity about what the Letting Up Fund will actually deliver in terms of the site. Also, the point um, perhaps is the sign that we're still covering exactly what, what the vision is, should the fact that it be successful. Thank you. Councillor Mackie. Thanks, Mr. Bridget. Uh, just to well, yes, um, I think it. A bit disappointed in some ways, the report elsewhere in the meeting we've been talking about the charge of social responsibility. Where I think that this you know, Birmingham Wheels, as they are as a company, do deliver socially quite a lot for the city. Uh, you know, they're giving sort of, I understand that there's lots of uh, local individuals uh, use the track and embrace their cars around that. I understand that there seems to be a corresponding drop in street racing from the area that around there. I'm not suggesting those people are the same people that are doing that, but that seems to be that certainly they're supplying something for uh, local people to use, and it's an avenue that um, the city is seeing a benefit from. The options that are being put forward in this report don't seem to be uh, addressing any of the uh, requirements that the leaseholder is asking for and, and I think that the leaseholder himself, the new one, is building a viable business here out of um, the assets that he's got and I think that the council can look again to see if they can accommodate um, his plans that are, that's being put forward. I think certainly in one year uh, extension of the lease that I think the leaseholder is asking for would seem only reasonable because quite a lot of items in this in this report are waiting for outcomes and other things to happen. So in that meantime, giving business the time to establishments itself and improve itself, I think would be um, only the fair amount of things to do. And I was going to echo Councillor Harvest's question around 
what the level of, of the fund was going to be used for. So I would have thought that actually supporting a business like Wills and allowing it to really you know, to use a smaller section of the site was exactly what the levelling up fund for was not being used to actually take an asset like this off a site that is delivering socially for the city. So I'm quite interested to hear what the money's being used for. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, that bid did come from a previous cabinet meeting, uh, I understand. So all the paperwork is in the public domain. Um, I'm just turning to Chrissy Hong. I'll turn to you cloud first and uh, to come back on some of those uh, some of those issues. Thanks, Councillor Jones. And um, certainly in terms of the asset of the UMC value application, it's a separate process, but there's no legal requirement for us to stop bring the site board of site remediation works in that meantime while that application is assessed. So that's done for a completely separate um, um, system. Um, in terms of background to this site, it's always worth remembering that the site was forfeited back to the council. Um, that was following an independent rent review of the wheels company. Um, the backdated rent only to the council at that point was over 800,000 pounds. And that they, they, uh, debt remains payable to the city council. So it's a significant debt to outstanding against the site. Um, at that point, the, the site was awarded back to the council, so the lease was handed back, so we had full control of the site again. Um, we put in place a 12-month extension at that point in time to support businesses with relocation. And I understand certainly since that point, a number of the existing businesses have moved. Um, what has happened is that new occupiers have subsequently come in. Um, so some of the businesses have relocated. Um, anyone who did come in knew full well what the terms of that lease was, that it was a 12-month lease with no possibility for extension. And we continue to work with other businesses remaining on the site, um, particularly the speed skating business, which in terms of social value does generate significant social value for the local community. And we're working very closely with them in terms of alternative site provision. And we will continue to do that, even if it means them having to go into temporary um, storage while their new facility is up and running. So that process will continue. Our state agent Savills are working with other occupiers to identify other sites which could be available to them, um, and we'll continue that process. Um, in terms of the leveling up bid, it is for full site remediation works. This is a significantly contaminated site, um, historic landfill site, and the amount of um, site remediation that will be needed to bring it forward for employment use will be significant. Um, but we need to get on with this work now. There is the Japanese knotweed extensively across the site, over 9,000 square metres. We have a statutory duty to deal with the knotweed, and we need to begin that process. We can't wait another year for it to go through another growing season and for that infestation to continue. And just to remind members that this is one of the most deprived wards in the city, over 20% unemployment in adjoining wards. This scheme, when it comes forward for development, will bring significant jobs, over 3,000 jobs to the local area, and will bring much needed investment into this, into this part of Birmingham. So a key part of these Birmingham inclusive <laughs> and a great opportunity to bring jobs and investment into Birmingham, which is much needed in this area. Thank you. I think that's the crux of it. Uh, we have had representations um, left on the table today, in fact, from um, people I know are currently on the site, um, and it's fully understood that that is causing some distress for them needing to move off. Um, but we have been up front uh, with people, with the people occupying the site, and they took on the lease about the, the nature of that and uh, the time that we repeat it back. And we do need to keep our eyes focused on the price here. Uh, as Ian has said, we have a record unemployment in some wards that are it. And the opportunity to provide some of them for people there uh, is quite, quite huge for the site. Uh, Councillor Chaffee, I'll bring that in. Um, I think you've covered it. The only other point I was going to make um, was exactly that around the social value, the greatest social value this council can offer to the people of East Birmingham is employment and sustainable jobs, quite honestly. Um, and therefore, uh, it's important that we utilise um, what um, opportunities there are in that area to deliver those um, opportunities. And I think that is our engagement city council. Thank you. Any other comments? Not seeing anybody? Okay, so with that in mind, uh, we have in front of us recommendation 2 1 to 11. Are those agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, that takes us on to plan for human activities November 2021 to January 2022. Councillor Chapter. Yeah, apologies, sorry, I'm just going to the right service. But this is, of course, the uh, the uh, famous what we are spending our money on report. Um, 
So, or spending the people of Birmingham's money, I should say. Um, so, uh, we just opportunity to welcome questions. I would, however, just like to bring to people's attention, they will have noted from that there is an additional item um, this time around, um, and that relates to uh, then in the public report that relates to the Southside Public Realm Works, where unfortunately our existing contractor um, has, uh, has collapsed, has failed, um, and therefore um, in order to progress those works, it is um, incumbent upon the council to find a, a new supplier, and that is outlined in the addendum. Um, and I would like to, um, if I can just quickly say, this has had to be done incredibly rapidly, obviously the news of that broke fairly recently, Officers have had to work incredibly quickly to try and get this over the line so we can continue to deliver what I think everyone um, in the room, I hope, will welcome a really important uh, bit of work and really exciting bit of work around Southside, one that is being supported uh, with local businesses, local partners, and human beings. So I think hopefully um, we agree that it is uh, the right step to move this forward, and therefore that has required a, um, a, a speeded up procurement process rather than going to the standard. Uh, with that, back to you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, so I've got a number of on, on different ones. Um, first of all, on, on the city dressing um, support hosting for Commonwealth Games item, um, there was a, an addendum or, or update sent out to it, which um, quite considerably changed the values. I was curious as to what the reasoning behind there is. Um, I won't go into the ways because they're on, on exempt papers. Uh, so if we can get some understanding of what, what's changed there. Um, the next one is around the Birmingham Transport Plan Delivery Plan, and it includes a number of services that are going to be required as part of um, this work, which I'm assuming is the work that Kevin kind of touched on earlier when he was taking the site. Um, I've asked that this was updated to also include, we've asked for a number of times, but actually the environmental impact of all the changes the council does, not just in the city centre, but on the wider city as well. So actually we can start having some um, actual data around so if there's any impact caused on the ring road and those five communities that live around the ring road, and um, obviously out into the suburbs of the city as well. But after that was added, um, the third one I wanted to raise a query around is the professional services to support the residential property acquisition program. Um, and so this right, this is the um, what the council brought through, I think it was a July cabinet um, around buying up private properties in Burke. Um, and I forgive me if I, if I remember this wrong, but we thought that was being done in either in partnership or through in reach. Um, if it is being done within reach, not, aren't they meant to have this expertise already? That was the whole purpose of this company, or is it not being done within reach? And that's why we need to get this, um, get this support in. And then the last one um, is a bit of an interesting one, the waste, uh, the water supply and wastewater services, thing, which again has been subject to some updates. Um, so on here, it it's, uh, explains that basically, um, I've understood my government had a contract since the regulation in 2017. Um, go down to the detailed bit. Um, this is a change to the contract and all amendment. Um, to what's proposed on the May 2020 um, report. Um, the May 2020 report said this would all be signed, sealed, um, done by November 2020. Obviously, we're now a year after that, um, and the council seemingly hasn't already um, made an agreement. Within some of the changes that are in this, the yellow block text, um, it says that part of the reason for the, the new proposal is that the Yorkshire purchasing organisation um, single contract supplier wasn't available um, at the time of the original report. My understanding is that they launched their first one in, in April 2017, or soon after that. So were both available when the council could have originally signed the contract, but also could be joined in May 2020 when the council previously had a report um, saying that they couldn't join it. Um, Clearly, something's gone wrong along the line there that's led to this situation. Again, not wanting to go into the numbers because I appreciate everyone is then, but the numbers here compared to the May 2020 report don't seem to tally up. Um, I'm accepting that some of this might need to take away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
both the smartest to provide us some of the differences uh, between them. There's quite a lot there. Um, first of all, some Commonwealth Games question and the reconciliation of the numbers. I'm looking, I think they haven't actually had an answer to Hannah. Well, I'm on the I did anticipate this question. Uh, <laughs> so the reason for the error was the approval was due to be presented at the, CD, the Commonwealth Games Strategy Board at the end of September. The value would not be confirmed until that meeting. Um, and unfortunately, the indicative value was not updated with the exempt, and when the exempt appendix was uploaded. Um, the services remain as stated in the report to assist uh, showing the city in the best light to the citizens and volunteers to run up to the games. I hope that. So it was effectively, it was an error, a mistake. The number should have been updated, and they weren't. But it's all within budget. It's obviously quite a large amount of difference, and I hope there's other estimations that show such differences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just contribute to this as well. So we are working really closely with the EOC, the organising community, and Stratford and TCMS. And, and this is our um, attempt to liberate more money into the city for, uh, we're calling it City Spectaculars, and it's it's to take our offer from good to great. But, but more importantly, it's taking um, city dressing outside the city centre. So it's taking it taking us out to um, the suburbs in the city. Because as you know, this should be a games and this will be a games for everyone. And we want everybody mm -hmm. in the city to experience that. So so it's uh, you know I, I I make no apologies for wanting the best for the city and you know, every resident lady. But but I accept that the mistake around it it's, it's a problem and we will rectify that. And if it's helpful, we'll give you more detail on what we're looking at. Councillor Shackler, back to you. I think on the transport plan issue, I will have to bring in a bill. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Leader. So, uh, Environmental Indications Council will be put as part of this work, where this is an overarching delivery plan. So, the commitment will be once we've got that detailed list of schemes. Be through our own governance process, the insurance framework, the mine authority, or the DFT, we will have to do detailed big business cases, of which uh, the environmental assessment is one of the three key strategic cases. So we will pick that up if that was uh, the question you asked. If it wasn't, uh, please repeat it after I go. <laughs> I, I think it answers the question that it's not going to be done as part of this, that, that we'll look at environmental impact of different options. But rather only afterwards when we've chosen those options. Is that what you're saying? We'll take a broader assessment because it does know in their carbon. So however, you know, carbon is only one aspect, isn't okay. it, of, of the environmental agenda. So I think if I give you my part of this work, we will pick that up and then the detailed assessments will come in those business cases that follow. Okay. okay. Uh, back to you now. Uh, yeah, on property acquisitions, um, just to confirm that is so the funding of the, this item on the PPAR does relate to that previous report around acquisitions of, um, on, the, on the street. Optics is really timely. But I'll bring uh, Ian in just on the detail of the Inrich. It's the capacity needed for Inrich. The delivery vehicle would be for Inrich to expand that capacity to run this company. <laughs> and finally, on the water supply question, um, I, I'll get back to you with more detail. That's my understanding is that essentially um, after deregulation, um, Okay, so for example, we have an existing contract, it's a contract, a legacy contract, um, best value out of that. Following deregulation, very few authorities entered into new contracts. Um, everyone was waiting to see what happened um, in the market. Margins very small, and the pricing is capped by government. So um, we are still, um, it's a little bit of hedging and a little bit of kind of seeing where we get best value out of, but I'll get you more detail on the question around the framework. That's all that's yeah, just whatever. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, sorry, Councillor Mackie. No, thanks very much. There's two points I was going to uh, ask about. Uh, first one was on the net weaver spend. Um, I think it's another one where the contract uh, expired actually in December, so we've been operating a uh, contract for what, so 10 months or so now. Um, the old contract, uh, actually, was something I was about to say the figure, it was like some panic, I can't remember if it's in the planning report or not, so I'll stay clear of it. But there's uh, obviously a large figure uh, attached to the spend for what, um, for this, for the expansion going forward. And I was just wondering how that would compare with the sort of contracted annual spend um, previously, and how confident is the council that 
this is the only expense that's going to be needed because obviously every contract yeah. where you've got SAP going to Oracle is known that it's an awful lot of work to do. They're normally overrun. I was just wondering, is this just a one step overrun or are we looking at this to be going further on? And the other question I was going to ask well, was about the south side um, public rem well, work. Sometimes you look through the course and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a bit in it there that sort of raised my eyebrows a bit because it said there that um, this was completely unforeseen. But um, I think the word on this company had been, had been out for a while, hadn't it? Uh, the sort of, it was in the trade press, uh, was well known. The auditor resigned on the 11th of August 2020. The secretary resigned the company on the 28th of August 2020. June 2020, the, the company took a loan against its share capital, taking a 90% hit against its um, share price. At the time, construction index trade news was going on and saying that this was the company was struggling. It was not to do with COVID. It was not to do with material shortage. And it's that it's actually the words that it uses. It understands the problems facing and uh, NMCM uh, may well, one has to look further back from the pandemic and material shortages. Um, these are all serious red flags that were out uh, against this company. Uh, I'm sort of really interested to know what mitigations we did as a council to try and alleviate the situation that we're finding in now. Uh, looking through the risk register going back south side, you know, didn't show anything in this in February 2021, even though it was in the press at the time. So I think the report said this was unforeseen. That may be that we didn't see it coming, but it was in the, it was well known to trade at the time the company was short. Okay, um, I might so on the SAP one, I know you've got a meeting with Peter Bishop later in the week, uh, so I'll stick that on his list to dive into. Um, Bill, do you want to come back on any of the uh, SAP side stuff? Um, just briefly, there's obviously an aspect of time there. Yeah. Um, as Councillor Chatfield knows, the Capital Board last week on the this item urgently that there is a need piece of work, how we do we get greater industry insight perhaps into some of these uh, contractors in the construction industry, uh, you know, all the relevant financial checks through finance were completed on the organisation. However, perhaps there's some further intelligence that we may need and need to think about a reason how we may obtain that in the future. What I would say is that rumours on the marketplace aren't always, and they appreciate in this case that got us to that, but businesses can go through restructuring. And if we don't always afford work based on what information we have. So I agree with you, know, we've got to have the right information about the financial. I mean, I mean the, the one I'm giving out here is I mean, there's charges on a monthly basis since June 2020 at Companies House against the company. This is not rumours in the trade, so and so may be struggling. You know, these are directors putting out PRC. Who publicly put out they were taking a 90% hit on their share price on money that they were being borrowed, and that was registered in the government's house. I mean, this is not a rumor. This is then when you're taking 90% cut of your share price, I mean, that is panic stations. So, I mean, I, I mean, I was aware of it. I was a bit shocked when I read that, that we said we were, because that's why I read the report. I went, whoa, if you know what I mean. So, um, but anyway. I was just going to look, I think there's clearly um, there's some questions that need to be explored, I think, around this. Right? So I, I'm confident in the due diligence processes we have. However, I think raising back to the market intelligence, market sensitivity, where there's some questions that need to be explored there. So with your um, well, say approval, uh, we will take that away. I'll pick up a discussion through procurement board and we'll try and establish some bait and see where improvements need to be made within that process. Okay. I think we've run out of questions, um, and there's a few that we have said that we'll come back to on. Uh, so we'll follow those up. Um, any other hands? I'll take this recommendation. So we have 2.1 in front of us. Is that great? Really? Thank you. Right. Final item uh, on behalf of the leader is appointments for outside bodies. And we've then got one. So following driving two, um, leaving us uh, to far north, uh, we have a vacancy on the Children's Trust Board, uh, which uh, Suzanne Dodd um, is uh, proposed to be appointed to. Um, that's recommendation 2.1. I'm not seeing any hands. Um, is recommendation 2.1 agreed? Agreed. 
Agreed. Lovely. Uh, that takes the end of the meeting. I'm not hearing any other urgent business. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll let you go as well. Oh, no. I apologise. Sorry, there's just one bit of point to raise. Um, obviously, people, I'm sure everyone table would have been on qualified to see that the latest in a number of homophobic attacks have been in the city um, in recent days, probably in the news. Um, and really, I'm sure the council is taking it seriously. I'll ask that the council, which they might be able to do now, but, but maybe send a note to all members and just explaining what it's doing to help protect people in the city. Yeah, we can very much do that. I'll pass to Councillor Cobb and those who are leading on this. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 what, what we've seen has been absolutely appalling. I know we all stand in, in solidarity uh, with, with, with victims of those, those incidents. We are taking this very seriously, we've got the Blue Community Safety Partnership, and I'll certainly ensure that there's a no to members advise us to how to take this. Absolutely, and very, very much echo those sentiments. Okay, any other business? Seeing any. Right, thank you very much, everyone. I'll let you go for the box somewhere. That's fine.